So uh, my name is Danny, and I'm just going to discuss a little bit about the science of learning today. So when I'm talking about the science, I don't just mean the biology or the chemistry or the physics behind, behind learning, but I'm also talking about the science behind the process of learning. So what are some, for example, what, what are some effective techniques that students can implement in order to be a more effective learner? So we can think a little bit about what learning is. Um, for some reason, that says 42, but that should say 2. So, um, <laughs> but learning can be defined in many different ways. But um, overall, it's a lifelong experience that can be conscious or subconscious. So even though you're sitting in this room today, uh, you might subconsciously be learning even though you're not aware of it. Learning involves a lot of repetition. So when you try to learn a skill, you try to do it over and over again in hopes that you get better at it. So in that sense, there's an aspect of mastery. Oh, what's your mind? Your mind. There we go. So there's an aspect of mastery, and there's also an aspect of reflection in the sense that you try to do that skill again and again, and then you think about what you've done, and you try to hone those skills so that the next time you do whatever you're trying to learn, you do it a lot better. But overall, you want to, uh, in a sense, also change your behavior. So for example, if you drive to school every day, but then maybe the next day you learn how to ride a bike, you might end up riding the bike instead to go to school instead of driving. So that's an example of behavior change. And learning is also diverse because there are many different ways that you can learn, and you also learn from many different people as well. But overall, the most important thing about learning is that it has to be fun. So it can't just be a little bit fun, it has to be very fun. Otherwise, um, we will, as humans, we will not be, uh, our brains are not designed to just go towards something that is a lot of work but is not a lot of fun. And so this aspect of fun can be informed by this chemical called dopamine. And so dopamine is a chemical in our brains that's associated with the brain's uh, reward center. So it's also associated with pleasure. And every time we uh, do something that makes us feel good, typically dopamine is associated with that behavior. Or if, yeah, with that behavior. Um, so as a feel good kind of chemical that occurs in our brain when we do something that's positive and we really enjoy it, this can be implemented in our classrooms. And actually, it is implemented in our classrooms every day. Um, so let me give you an example. Let's say that a teacher teaches a lesson and then the teacher asks the class, what's 1 plus 1? And the student raises his hand, and he says that the answer is 2. Then the teacher can reward the student by saying, good job, or by giving him a sticker or some kind of reward of some sort. And inherently, what that teacher is doing is encouraging that type of behavior. He's, he, the teacher is encouraging that student to engage in learning and to um, to be focused so that he or she can um, learn more about that subject that the teacher is teaching. So then what are two ways that we can make this type of teaching more effective? Um, so I'll be discussing two ways. So one way is called deliberate practice. So the idea behind deliberate practice is that the activities that you engage in to learn um, is meaningful. So for example, let me give you a scenario. Which player would uh, be the better shooter after 100 hours? So you can have player A on the, is this the left or the right? This is the left, right? OK, left. Uh, so player A shoots 200 practice shots per hour and keeps a, shot, a record of the shots made, shots missed, and the errors. So there's a lot of self-reflection going on with player A. But player B shoots 50 shots per hour. Um, he dribbles, dribbles leisurely and takes several breaks. So according to the idea behind deliberate practice, um, and there's actually a whole book on this, it's called Peak by Anders Ericsson. So um, the idea behind deliberate practice is that the practice is meaningful, it's focused, and there has a purpose behind everything that you do when you're trying to learn something. So player A is going to most likely be the better shooter because he is recording um, what he's been doing, how he, what errors he made, and what he can improve on. So here's an artist's rendition of what deliberate practice is compared to just practice. So if you just practice, you might um, reach a certain skill, but then you won't improve much because you're just practicing. But the idea behind deliberate practice is that 
when you take the time to reflect on what you've been doing, you can gradually improve and you can keep improving. Um, <clears throat> so what, sometimes as a TA, I talk to students who tell me that they spend seven hours reading a textbook and they still didn't do well on an exam. And most likely that's because they're just practicing. They're reading the textbook, but they're not really understanding what they've read. So, but it, maybe if that student spent three hours instead and focused on the ideas of deliberate practice where the student is really reading a little bit but is gaining as much from that small portion of reading as possible, maybe that student can do a lot better than just reading a textbook for seven hours. Okay. And when you engage in deliberate practice, um, you have this kind of feedback loop. And throughout that feedback loop, you receive um, information about what, you've, what you have not been doing right. And so when you do that right, and you correct your mistakes, you get this surge of dopamine in your brain because you're learning, right? So that's one way that you can implement, um, the, or by implementing deliberate practice, that's one way that you can get more effective learning. So the second way is the, called the Pomodoro technique. So let's say that you don't have a coach, you don't have a teacher, you're just by yourself. How can you be a better learner? So Pomodoro is Italian for the word tomato. So this the idea is based on this tomato timer. But of course, your timer does not have to be a tomato. Um, so one, you identify the task. Everyone see that? So one, you identify the task that you want to improve on. And number two, you set your timer to 25 minutes. And then after 20, so during that 25 minutes, you work on the task with no distractions. And then you take a break. Um, yep, and you mark the task as done, and then you end up taking a break. So the idea behind that break is that you're rewarding yourself for taking a break so that you will engage in learning again. So, and when you take that break, you get this, you can get, you may get a surge of dopamine in your brain that encourages you to repeat that kind of behavior. So then you can do this for uh, three or four segments um, and then you can take a longer break and that's kind of like your more sustained reward. Um, and then you can repeat this process over and over again um, every day if you would like. And um, hopefully that will help you to become a more effective learner. So I've talked about these two techniques, the deliberate practice and the Pomodoro technique. Of course, everyone is a little bit different. So everyone's uh, idea of thinking might be modified a little bit. So you can adjust these techniques as you would like. But those are two techniques that um, we have discussed. So thank you. Yes. Have you tried convincing your own students to use one of these techniques, and have you found anecdotally any improvements in their test scores or anything like that? Yeah, so it's in, I have talked with students, but they don't realize that they're, they think that their method is the best method. So st sometimes students can be very stubborn, and that's because a lot of us have a very difficult time of seeing past their own perspective. So the student is spending, the more time you spend, the more time, the more you're supposed to gain from this. So I have talked to my students, but they don't seem to understand. <laughs> but of course, that's based on the person. But yes, whoever. So for the, the first technique, the, um, I the deliberate practice, um, yeah. I can understand how this could be useful for reviewing an exam. Right. But I don't think that that's what you really mean here. It sounds like you want it to be more incremental as they're, as they're studying. So how yeah. do you apply this during the study process? Like what would you suggest the student do in, while studying? Right. So I guess if I were to go back to the textbook example, um, if you were to just practice, maybe you just read the textbook. But then in terms of deliberate practice, if you're trying to read the textbook itself, maybe you pick out a few key points that you really want to hone in on, and you focus on those points instead of reading everything. And so for the exam, maybe um, you can talk with the professor, or maybe you can go over the textbook to see like, what, what the big picture is. Because many times, I find that when students are reading the textbook, they read every word of the textbook. But maybe that's not necessarily helpful for them. Yes? So have you thought about how you could incorporate this into like a classroom setting of like in, in how we teach to yeah. incorporate some of these right. concepts to support learning? Yeah, I have, I've tried to incorporate that 
in my own class as a TA. So I have, I'm teaching this Chem 1CL, chem, general chemistry lab. And so every lab, students write a lab report. And in that lab report, pretty much the students are asked to write about everything. But instead of, and when I find that, I find that when I ask my students to write about everything, their lab reports are not as, uh, quote unquote, good because there is so much in these labs that they end up not knowing what they're trying to write about. So instead, I focus on the few key points that are important on each lab, and I ask them to explain what, what those key points are. Um, and I guess if you're doing this in some kind of uh, non-science-based class, which I've uh, had some people tell me that those classes are different from the science-based classes, so in a non-science-based class, you can focus on the big picture and ask students to just talk about those key points instead of asking them to talk about the whole, in, in the entire, entirety of the course, if that makes sense. Yeah. Actually, kind of a follow-up to Lisa's. Have you ever used the Pomodoro technique in lab? Like structured it so students have a break every so often? Because I know labs are Yeah, all yeah, the time. right. Um, my answer is no. <laughs> because... Um, some of the labs, they ask you to do many procedures. And so in those procedures, if you take, and the labs are only scheduled for four hours, or uh, if the labs are longer than four hours, I would be more than happy to schedule that in. But just for the sake of time, I haven't had an opportunity to think about that. But that is something that maybe I can think about too. Yeah. Yes. Another question about, um, I think something that would also resonate with your call okay. and this like, previous one, uh, like especially regarding the uh, the encouragement that have, has to do with this like rewarding uh, strategy. I remember one time when I first came to US and I, I, I ended up just uh, conducting a lab for non-physicists. Yeah. Uh, and I just I was just like putting little things like in the lab reports like well done you know just like you did great here yeah but, yeah you know something like that right and, and <clears throat> at the end of the course a student came to me and said you know just she hated physics so much you know but like those like encouragements kind of like kept her engaged yeah right right in the lab and yeah like, i'm just i just would like that what you said actually resonated with me and i just would like to share yeah thank you it, it really works thanks um so one of the other things that I guess people can incorporate in classrooms is, I guess, instead of just taking off points for what students did not do right, we can maybe also reinforce what they did correctly. So that gives them the idea that even though maybe they didn't do so well on a certain exam, but they did well in certain parts, and that will keep the students going. Right. So. All right, thank you.